Thank you everyone for uh, joining us. And um, we have a, a great action-packed agenda today. Uh, I'm gonna invite Paola Avendano, who, her, who heads uh, government relations for our external affairs uh, to give uh, some words of welcome. Uh, and then I'll uh, do a brief presentation. Uh, and then we have some invited speakers to offer some commentary. And most of the work's gonna happen in breakout sessions. We're really excited. Uh, for what's in store. So first, let me turn it over to Paula. All right, thank you, er uh, thank you, Eric, for being a DJ. <laughs> um, and Karthik, thank you uh, for uh, welcoming me really quickly. Uh, so I won't take long. Um, I want to say good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, you know, welcome to the 2021 Inland Empire Policy Summit. Uh, we are happy that you are all here with us today. Uh, my name is Paola Vendano, and I'm with the Center for Social Innovation. Um, and we, we've had the opportunity to work uh, with many of you who are on this call, uh, but for those of you who may potentially not know who the center is, uh, the Center for Social Innovation provides a credible research voice uh, here in the Inland Empire uh, that spurs civic and leadership and policy innovation. Um, its reputation is built on the key pillars of social, of social science, strategic policy awareness, innovation mindsets, and deep community partnerships. So we are excited to share with you all of the amazing work that the Inland Empire has to offer. Today, you will hear from a number of leaders across different sectors uh, using unique strategies, tools, and resources to advance their mission. Uh, most importantly, you will learn how they will, um, they have established special collaborations to accomplish a shared vision and achieve uh, positive outcomes for the region. Um, so with that said, I will actually turn it back to Karthik, who will be providing a presentation on today's program. Great. Thank you, Paula, and thank, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have over 130 people in the room, I think over 200 who have registered. Uh, this will be recorded, uh, at least in terms of the main stage, uh, in terms of what we discuss and decide uh, today. First, I just want to give a little bit uh, of context about our approach. Uh, Eric, next slide, please. So many of you uh, have seen this slide before, and this in many ways uh, guides the work that we do in partnership with community. Uh, and it's a very simple framework of DNA, which is data, which includes data and research and insights, but ultimately it's data, narrative and action. And uh, we feel very privileged to be in a space where, especially being in a university, to have the credible data and research, but also working with community partners on narrative change. Uh, and then finally, to make sure they're all tied into some kind of strategic action. And that is part of what we're doing today as well. We're not gonna have a lot of data thrown at us. Uh, there's plenty of reports that we have as background reports that inform the packet that was sent out to attendees. Now that packet is a draft um, that will turn into an appendix to a report that'll be coming out of this summit. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of context about the Center for Social Innovation. Believe it or not, this slide comes from the launch of our center three years ago. And the same that we said back then applies today. So if you can click to the next animation, Eric. So when we called ourselves the Center for Social Innovation, it was intentional. Uh, partly because when you think about where innovation happens in California, when you ask people to drop pins on a map, where is innovation occurring in California? Very likely they're gonna drop pins up and down the coast of California, right? I mean, they'll think about high tech, social media tech and biotech up in the Bay Area. They'll think about entertainment tech in LA with Silicon Beach. They'll think about biotech beach uh, down in San Diego and other tech uh, in Orange County as well. Next animation. By contrast, the dominant adjectives that are used to describe and characterize inland California are not innovation oriented, are not asset oriented. They're usually deficit oriented. People talk about problems, people talk about um, corruption, people talk about struggles. Now, of course, we're not gonna paper over these things. These things do exist in inland California, but by the way, they exist in coastal California too, and in some, to some degree, even worse in many parts of coastal California, but that's not their dominant narrative. So how do we make sure that innovation, leadership, change makers, these are the kinds of narratives that get projected out? Click again, Eric. 
And fortunately, what we've seen in the last three years, first of all, all of these existed prior to the existence of our center. It just wasn't well known or talked about. We are proud of the work that we do with community partners to make sure that everyone understands that when they talk about our region, they talk about the assets, they talk about the amazing leaders, younger leaders, leaders of color, people who are making a difference in terms of advancing core values. Next slide. So in terms of our, um, in terms of our core values, oh, I guess uh, for some reason this last version, well, I'll just speak over this. Uh, one thing I should note is that about a year into our work, we went from just being agnostic to say, we want any kind of investment uh, coming into this region to starting to have more focus. And the focus was on inclusion and equity. So this was well before Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and the, um, the racial reckoning that we've had for over a year now. So we decided a full year prior to that, that instead of just grabbing any opportunity we can get, part of it was a way to focus, right? To say that we're not just gonna do anything. We're not just gonna say, let's just, any money is good money, just bring it in and it's gonna improve our region. Um, we said, we're gonna start focusing on inclusion and equity. And in the course of doing this, we saw that there were so many different partners. Now, there are too many to list. There's just a few here that we've thrown onto the screen uh, that are doing equity work. But this also now creates a new kind of a problem. One of the things we hear time and again from funders outside the region, government partners outside the region, they get confused. They said, there's so many great things going on. I can't make sense of it all. Who is doing what? What is the approach? What is the issue that people are working on? And now these are organizations, some of them are collective efforts, and there are many more collective efforts, right, that are, that, that are taking place right now that are all um, trying to advance equity work. Next slide. So one attempt to try to bring some coherence to all of this work that is occurring um, was, uh, was what we did in advance of the Regions Rise Together gathering in November, 2019. Um, that uh, focus was largely on, um, on the economy. And we came up, and this was work that we did in collaboration with the Inland Empire Communities Foundation, um, as well as um, Inland Empire Economic Partnership to put this together. And you see this on our website. This is an initiative about, that's from November, 2019. It has not been updated since November, 2019. We're gonna change that. Uh, so we're gonna update it based on all of the input that people have given. Um, and we'll continue to collect it through a Google form that we have asked folks to lift up um, initiatives that are occurring on a few key themes. Um, so next slide, Eric. So the themes that we are highlighting, and we can add more if, uh, if folks like some of those earlier themes and want to bring them in, but the themes for this summit um, our civic infrastructure, and we'll define what we mean by that in the breakout session, but essentially civic infrastructure is not just the civic engagement infrastructure that folks typically think of, but it also includes things like um, local media, uh, community serving media, ethnic media. Um, it also includes the nonprofit infrastructure. It could also include the data infrastructure on community partnerships that can support that work. We also have another theme, which is broadly speaking, inclusive and equitable economic development. We have a theme on health equity, we have a theme on education equity. We have a theme on transportation and environment. And we have a theme on housing and community development. Now, this is just an example of some of the initiatives um, that have been lifted up um, that are going on in our region uh, that meaningfully advance equity work. Next slide. So in terms of the goals and deliverables of the summit, this is gonna be very different from any kind of summit that we've done before policy summit that we've done before and that most people are used to. What you're not gonna get out of this is a list of uh, investment asks that come, that, that come out of this. Uh, most summits don't do that. Most summits are just there for people to get exposed to new ideas uh, and possibly make some new connections through networking in the lobby. There's uh, still room for networking here in terms of DMs that people can send each other uh, and build continue building community with each other. Fortunately, our center in partnership with the Inland Empire Community Foundation meets every Wednesday morning at this hour from eight to 9.15 to continue building community. We wanna go beyond that. 
uh, what we want to do is one, uh, to get agreement on shared values and operating principles. This is something that we feel that our region is on the cusp of doing. Uh, when we launched our center, Ashley Swaringen, who's the uh, CEO of the Central Valley Community Foundation, had come down to help launch our center and to talk about the work that was happening in Fresno. She was not sugarcoating the work that was occurring there, but what she said made a huge difference in Fresno was after years, if not decades, of different people doing different things, not in conversation with each other, and sometimes pulling in different directions and sometimes even undermining each other, for leaders who are focused on some key uh, goals to get aligned on what are those core values and what are the core operating principles that they're gonna agree on. We'll have a chance in the breakout session. In fact, most of the breakout session is not a show and tell. Most of the breakout session is work to talk about what are the kind of values that we want to lift up and prioritize and hold ourselves accountable to. And similarly, in terms of operating principles among the leadership, the collective leadership of this region. Two, we want to provide coherence and raise awareness on strategic initiatives that advance inclusion, sustainability, and equity. Right? We don't want outsiders or even insiders sometimes to be confused about what are all these different things. What is GIA? What is IE Rise? What is IE Go? What is Generation IE? Right? I mean, there's just so many, you know, so many different initiatives that are going on um, to have. A, a database. So our commitment here is to not wait, you know, a year and change to update these things. We are going to create a live database that has key contact information, key information about the approach, the leadership, the milestones, and the achievements of different initiatives. Third, um, we're going to be introducing and fleshing out the Rise Ready framework uh, that we are excited about. This is work that we've been building through the IE Rise uh, initiative over the last year, uh, and it aligns very strongly with uh, the Biden administration's commitment to climate resilience as well as racial equity. Literally, the president is going to be talking today about infrastructure investments that advance those key goals that were laid out in their executive in his executive prior executive orders. Uh, but there are also state funding opportunities. We're also going to solidify our collective commitment to coordinate and collaborate when aligned, including on federal, state. Uh, and local investment opportunities and projects. Next slide. So quickly in terms of the RISE framework, um, we, don't, uh, we don't wanna spend too much time. You see this in your information packet. We're really excited about this. When we talk to folks in other parts of the country, they see the alignment with what the Biden administration and others are talking about in terms of moving away from this notion of shovel ready to what many are calling shovel worthy but it's still pretty vague in terms of what does shovel worthy mean? We think that we need to be explicit on those core values of what resilience means. So here we define resilience uh, as the interconnected nature of system functioning and how it can absorb, recover from and continue after some kind of a shock. This is so important as we think not only about the pandemic, but the kinds of environmental shocks that we receive periodically in our region and that we need to be ready to respond to. And this includes not just environmental shocks, but economic shocks and social shocks as well. Next slide. Inclusion. Um, inclusion is, is a concept that is thrown about, uh, but we also need to get specific in terms of what we mean by inclusion. Uh, so we talk about inclusion as the extent to which communities are recognized and included in decisions, plans, programs, and projects. We are coming up with a set of indicators so that we can measure what progress looks like and that folks can hold themselves and each other accountable to. So we can think about inclusion by breadth, by the quality of inclusion, going from marginalization of, of groups and communities to tokenization, to subordinate partnerships, to equal partnerships. We can also think about inclusion in terms of depth, whether it's just the grass tops that are included or if it's the grassroots, meaning the community members themselves that are included in these conversations, decisions, plans, programs, and projects. And then finally, we can think about inclusion at various stages, from the initial brainstorm phase and visioning stage to the design stage, project proposal stage, resourcing stage, implementation stage, learning and evaluation stage, and the reform and redesign stage. Now, all of us, I think, inherently know that we make better decisions when we are as inclusive as possible. 
it's more efficient to do this than realize when you're way down a path that if you had included someone, you would have avoided a lot of trouble. Uh, the key is we want to set up indicators so that people can uh, ensure progress on these dimensions. Next slide. Sustainability. A lot of people, when they think about sustainability, think only about environmental sustainability. Um, we are working with a definition of sustainability uh, that talks about conditions that promote individual and community health and well being. Environment is certainly an important part of it, but there are other factors that are just put under quality of life that sound like one of those nice to have things, but they have important implications for individual and community health. Long commute times are not good for individual health, the health of families, as well as civic health. People don't have as much time to do to be going to a PTA meeting or a city council meeting or a planning commission meeting if they're stuck for two hours in traffic. And finally, we can also think about sustainability as economic sustainability. How do we smooth out the boom and bust cycles uh, and what it does to our communities? How do we also make sure that individuals and households are sustainable economically, that they have adequate wages to meet the cost of living and do not have to continually rely on government support to get it done? Next slide. And then finally, on equity, we focus on whether investments, policies, and practices intentionally focus on improving outcomes among historically marginalized populations and whether the outcomes actually improve. It is one thing to talk about equity as just a vague aspirational goal. It's another thing to have an intentional focus on it, right? And then finally, whether those conditions actually improve. So this is not the rising tide lifts all boats. You want to make sure that the boats with the most holes in their hull are repaired first. Um, and that the ones that, um, you know, that have additional hulls, double hulls, triple hulls of protection, uh, they too will rise, but we need to make sure that those with the, with, with, that are most vulnerable um, benefit from that. Um, next slide. So that's our uh, initial framework on, uh, on what we're calling a, a rise ready jobs. We want to get this out into circulation within a couple of weeks because we think it'll inform not only the conversation uh, in our region, but nationally as well. And we're working with folks that do national work and even international work that are excited about this framework um, that is being developed. Um, before we move into our breakout sessions, I wanna invite some comments from a few key folks that have been doing work in the region for quite some time. Uh, and if each can just give a couple of minutes of commentary uh, in terms of what they think about the work that we're trying to do here in the context of what they individually are trying to achieve, either in their organization or in their collective. So first, I'm going to ask Dina Walker, uh, who's the CEO of Blue Educational Foundation and a co-founder of the Black Equity Initiative of the IE. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Karthik, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm just excited about, you know, what you just went through. Um, I had a chance to look at some of the slides prior in the 2019 uh, report and just listening to the presentation this morning, very optimistic. And, and I just took some notes really quickly, so I'm going to just share on those. There's five key points. One of the things is around equity, um, specifically, you know, uh, being courageous uh, here today uh, and the fact that we've started looking at equity even prior to the racial unrest um, this past summer of 2020. So that's been a very good thing for us to be able to say that, you know, we started this before the stuff hit the fan. Um, so that's very optimistic. And the fact that we're looking at data and being very deliberate about the data. So looking at what's happening um, with all kinds of folks all through the region. Um, so that's one of the pieces that I, that I saw. The other piece is around inclusion, um, very much around you know, having new people at the table. Um, so just some of the new collaboratives um, that have come about, some of the collectives that are coming about, and then also some of the ones that have been standing, bringing other people into the fold. Uh, and that inclusion also bringing young people uh, into the fold. So those are pieces. Um, the next thing is collaboration. Yes, long-term we've been hearing the IE doesn't collaborate, but my experience in these last two years has been phenomenal, has changed the game since I've been here back in the Inland Empire for almost 20 years now. Um, but these last two years seen a significant increase in collaboration um, across region, across cities, across programs. Um, and that is what I'm seeing in, this, uh, in the presentation. Uh, the last thing is, uh, again, innovation. This is an opportunity for new ideas and, and creation. 
Um, this is all this great work that you know you guys are uh, that that you're presenting today that will work out today on those values. It's about the new ideas and the great things that are going to come out of the Inland Empire. Um, this is the optimism of the area, and I think um, you know we all here on this call today for this summit. Uh, I'm sorry if you thought it was going to be one of those old school sit and gets. Um, we're going to put you to work in your breakout sessions, and we look forward to what comes after this. Thank you, Carthen. I look forward for the work for the rest of this morning. Thank you so much, Dina. Uh, next, and I'm going to ask Eric if you can highlight the speakers so that they can get spotlighted. Next, we have Nicole Cleary, Cleary from UCR's CSER. Okay, thank you, Karthik. Um, this is a great morning. I, I was present in the 2019 workshop that you did, and I think it was a great start. Um, but I do agree, more is needed. And um, we have been working with community groups for several years now. And I think when you highlight the word equity, uh, we, in our research, we've been trying to, one second, please. Sorry. Sorry about that. So in, in our work, um, we've been working with community groups for several years. And the difference that's made in our research and the impact, I think, is significant. I mean, one of the things is um, we have good intentions of having an equitable outcome. But without those community groups involved, we really don't know if those holes are being plugged. And so um, it's been a great, I think, asset for the community and our research to integrate that in with everything. And then the next thing I wanted to say is um, when you say you talk with the governor's office and they are confused about all of the initiatives that are going on, um, I would agree with that. And I feel like I'm on the ground level and trying to be a part of this research. And indeed, I am confused about who are the key players, who to go to. Um, we're trying to do interdisciplinary work in terms of having um, people from education, from community, from the environment, from the government. And so it's difficult to understand who should we go to, who should we talk to, who are the experts, and um, who should be included in our in our, our efforts. So I think this is a really good opportunity to continue what you started in 2019 and to show um, how we can all work together. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicole. Now we're gonna go from Nicole Cleary to another Nicole who does very different work uh, in our region, Nicole Starks-Murray from US Vets. So uh, a couple of minutes, Nicole, of your thoughts, hopes, and reactions. Good morning, everyone, and hopefully um, just in short that uh, the investment today will translate into the actions that we need to see, hear, and be a part of. As a collaborative um, organization and being a part of this uh, awesome group, we have, um, you know, all of us know that the Inland Empire has kind of been left off the map for some reason. And we are dedicated collaborators, partners, um, people of interest, funders. I mean, we don't want anyone to be confused about why we do what we do because we cover in the Inland Empire, San Bernardino being the largest county in the whole United States and Riverside being a very large county as well, a, a lot of breath and a lot of space. We're advancing core values collaboratively and collectively um, through IE Rise. I have seen us say we can be a, a, a group, a, a collaborative group. We all are very special and very important in what we do in our sphere of work. Can you imagine coming together? Can you imagine pulling together and having a brand and a force? To, 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 to be able to present to policymakers, to funders, to people who want to get this work done. The work is great, um, but the laborers are few. And I don't know that the laborers are few in the sense of um, people wanting to, but being able to strategize and pull together and really come out saying, this is what is needed. Uh, inclusion, equity, collaboration, vestment, accountability, 
um, this, this, our efforts have really been, um, uh, you know, pushed forward to say we, we won't not be heard. We will not not be able to provide services in the needed spaces in our region. And we will pull in the kind of resources collectively together um, that we need for this region. Our, our, per capita, our per capita dollars are quite less than very smaller other, uh, other smaller regions. Why? Is it just because people are not clear about what we need to do and how we need to do it. So your vested interest today and you're coming together to work with us. This team is accountable. We're, we're, we're pushing forward, we're forging forward, and we wanna see some applicable outcomes. So Great. I invite you to the table to partner with us. And, and US Vets, we provide uh, veteran services, but uh, everyone in this collaborative provide a, a service that we can link together to get this work done. So I encourage Great. you to do so. Thank you so much, Nicole. And then finally, we're running just a couple of minutes late, but uh, we'll catch up a little bit in the first breakout session, hopefully. Um, we have Kurt Lewis, uh, who is from the office of US Representative Pete Aguilar, uh, who wants, it, we invited him to talk about a new funding opportunity that we think uh, is, is important for everyone here to know about. And within two weeks, we need to get different funding requests into various member district offices. So Kurt, welcome. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're speaking about the community project funding. Uh, it is a new program that allows your congressman to have a, a, a major voice in, in uh, making investments in our community. The whole idea is that we're gonna help move a portion of money from Washington, D.C. to the local decision makers. And so that's a good thing. Uh, one of the things that we're noting though is that the federal government has made some extremely impactful investments in our community. And our guiding principle should be, what's gonna happen with those funds? Will the projects that come out of that, those funding, will they be, how will they be used? Will they be shovel ready? Will they be shovel worthy? Uh, will they provide uh, support for all, all the areas that we're looking for? Let me give you an example, of what I'm talking about. And the American Revenue, the Re American Rescue Plan allocated millions of dollars for counties, cities, for education, for healthcare, and the uh, community project funding is gonna add to that, of course, but there's an emphasis on just this one piece. I think we should broaden our scope to look at all of the funding that's come in recently. What can we do to make sure that this, these monies are being spent wisely and effectively? And in terms of the community project funding, uh, there are a couple things that we need to make sure that, uh, that we know what the program is set up for. It's set up to address the needs of the community. So uh, any project, the Congressman only has 10 slots that he can fill. And he's gonna be looking at, be guided by what are the project needs and what is the level of support for those particular projects. So in terms of what we can do as we can galvanize around projects that we think that are worthy and support them and, uh, and, and just make sure that as we go forward, we look to see what, uh, how funding is gonna be used. So I think that's gonna be the major things. What's gonna happen, how, what's, what projects will be selected and how will those fundings be used? Uh, do they have the, the adequate support and what needs of the community do they address? And I think that, that would be a good start for going forward with this program and the, all of the other fundings that's coming into our community as well. Thank you so much, Kurt, and especially with Congressman Aguilar having the seniority that he does in the Appropriations Committee. We're hopeful not only in terms of changing what it looks like in this region, but even to shape the agenda of what it looks like so many other inland communities throughout the country. Um, I, and a couple of quick points that, that you mentioned, Kurt, that I think is important to emphasize. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming down to the counties from the federal government. Yes. Uh, and we need to make sure that if we agree, whatever core values that we agree on, we have laid out resilience, inclusion, sustainability, and equity. These seem pretty, you know, it seemed pretty apple pie to us. I don't know who would disagree that, you know, no, you know what? We don't want to bounce back. <laughs> you know, we don't want to be sustainable. 
we don't want to be inclusive. We don't want to care about those that have been like most deeply marginalized in, in, in our history. So, but there are other values we'll be talking about today as well. So we're hopeful uh, that with the kind of leaders that are in this meeting, not only community leaders and leaders in labor, leaders in environment, et cetera, but government leaders that are here, leaders in philanthropy that are here, this is precisely what we want to do. Because what we have found is that when people align on values, you are able to move so fast. You know, you might have heard this expression that people can move at the speed of trust, and it's important to build those trusting relationships. It is also important to align on values. Because if there's a fundamental disagreement on values, it's going to be really, really difficult to get things done. So Kurt, thank you so much. I know that you have other things later on today, but we're glad we were able to slot you in and to get people to think about the incredible opportunity we have, not only with the CPF that is due on April 14th, and we'll talk about that when we, after our breakouts and we come back together with a game plan for what's going to look like for sprinting in the next two weeks and coordinating. It's a bit like musical chairs or speed dating, however one wants to think about it. But beyond that, uh, how do we do this work for the rest of the year and in the years to come? So um, thank you everyone. And then Eric, let's move to the next slide, which is gonna be a guide to breakout sessions. So um, we have three breakout sessions to begin. Um, and the, we've experienced some chaos in the past in terms of how this happens. So I think Eric, we're gonna do it in which we're gonna give people a random assignment and then you can move once you're in whatever breakout session. Is that correct? Okay, Eric's nodding, yes. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, because in the past when we, we did one major national summit where we allowed people from the get-go to choose and about a third of the group could not choose a breakout room and it was chaos. So let's try this. So these are the three things. So economic development, health equity and civic infrastructure. If you get randomly assigned to something you are not happy about and you wanna move, please do so within the first minute. So Eric, do your magic. Good morning, welcome back everyone. We have about 30 seconds for the rooms to officially close out. So if everyone can just hang tight. We will be beginning our second session soon. Session B, so these are the three sessions to consider uh, soon. I know we had some technical difficulties with folks jumping between rooms. I think we'll be fixing that. Um, so please uh, just hang tight. I see Karthik's here as well, in case you want to uh, say anything, Karthik, and then we can break out for the second session. Uh, yeah, no, it was, a, well, the session we had, Eric, was amazing. I hope others had a great session as well. We covered a lot of territory. There is that Google form in terms of um, shared values and core principles uh, for folks to lift up as what they would see as their priorities. And we'll be reporting back on that um, at the end when we come back out of this second set of uh, breakout sessions. So please uh, please make sure to use the Google form to do it so that we are able to adequately capture uh, your opinions and preferences. Uh, so next, Eric, let's take us into the breakout session too. So it's on uh, transportation, on, on first is education equity, second is transportation and environment, third is housing and community development. Again, if you're in the wrong room, please go ahead and jump into the right room. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we had a very generative conversation in our breakout sessions. Hopefully you did as well. Um, if you haven't yet had a chance to fill out that, there's two different Google forms, right? There was the initiative map that you got as part of your preparation and we're continuing to collect that information uh, and keep it open for another few days so we can really build out that new initiative map. But also when it comes to these values and principles um, uh, so that we can aggregate that uh, while, while folks are doing their um, report out. Um, but really so grateful for all of your engagement uh, and, and deep engagement here uh, during these sessions. So Eric, if you can go ahead and uh, do that um, screen share, uh, and then we'll have the different leads uh, provide, uh, provide a couple of minutes of, um, of report back. Eric, are you able to share your screen? Okay, so uh, first, now I have to remember back to the first session. Uh, I was the lead on the uh, inclusive uh, economic development. Um, we had we had an action-packed conversation. Uh, there are a lot of different initiatives uh, that are going on um, that are 
advancing inclusive and sustainable and equitable economic development today. So the sense we got is that these are not things that are in a far off distance. They're actually things that are occurring right now. So this includes um, the work in the Salton Sea uh, uh, communities area that Alianza in coalition with a bunch of other partners and also for disclosure with our center doing is to, is to start fleshing out this vision of what uh, an inclusive and equitable and sustainable future, uh, economic future for the Salton Sea community region looks like, especially with projects coming online like Lithium Valley, but also other uh, efforts around the region, and especially thinking about the economic devastation of COVID and what that, what that different future looks like um, that can, um, that can uh, uplift uh, the economic fortunes of folks with different skills and in different occupations. We also heard from Chaharia Kausji from Warehouse Workers Resource Center with, uh, with reports on the High Road Training Partnership, uh, which has been uh, an innovation grant from the state uh, that is working with uh, employers and with labor and with community organizations and with, um, with our community college system and workforce development system uh, to grow more high road. And these jobs are jobs with benefits, full-time work, uh, that provide opportunities for economic mobility and importantly help the state achieve its greenhouse gas reduction goals. We also heard from Deborah Mustaine from Riverside Community College District talking both about the work that's under IEGO that has different components that tie in with other work that is happening, um, but also with workforce development work, especially including apprenticeships and really accelerating and scaling up those opportunities. We also heard from Rodolfo Torres who is the vice chancellor from UCR uh, in the Office of Research and Economic Development, um, talking about OASIS. Now this OASIS is an acronym, uh, which is the Opportunities to Advance uh, Sustainability, Innovation and Social Inclusion, but it's bigger than just about what's going on. It's also an a university research park, um, but it's beyond that as well. So in addition to that, OASIS, it's our answer to Silicon Valley or Biotech Beach. Instead of being uh, embarrassed about being in a semi-arid to desert region is to see that as an asset. And also that notion of social inclusion of everyone being welcome at the Oasis uh, and to think about what that looks like about building green tech and clean tech with equity and inclusion as core to that. Uh, so that's something that's uh, already underway and if you have more questions on that, uh, I don't know, uh, Rodolfo or Kathy Eiler who are here, if you can drop your info in the chat if people wanna learn more and to be able to partner with that effort. I would say that for anyone uh, that has initiatives that would welcome uh, uh, partnerships, please do drop your um, contact information in the chat. We'll have that in the initiative map, of course, that's gonna be coming out about a week from now on our website. Finally, we heard from Joyce John. Uh, from the city of Riverside, who is part of several projects involving uh, food systems and innovations when it comes to food systems, from growing food to the distribution of food to diversifying the kind of land use decisions we have, so that just like monocultures are not good uh, for all sorts of reasons, if we're trying to build more resilient systems, we don't want to have a monoculture economy of sorts, right? So we want to think about what that diversification looks like. Um, in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of economic development moving forward, uh, in terms of shared values, norms, and operating principles, uh, I'll you know there's a lot of ground to cover, but uh, I'll come back later to present the results that we have from our uh, from our Google form. Uh, back to you, Eric. Well, I guess next we have Gary from uh, Health Equity. Gary, if you can give a quick report back. Yeah. Hi everybody, so my name is Gary and I'm the research manager at CSI and I facilitated the health equity session. So we had a really good conversation that unfortunately was cut a little short. We heard from our speakers and simultaneously talked about some of those shared values in the chat. So I hope that everyone was able to talk a little bit more about those shared values in the second session, which had a little bit more time. But when talking about the collective work, we heard from our speakers about some really great work they're doing, um, stuff that we'll be flagging a lot uh, in our report that will be coming out of the summit. So some of the themes uh, folks talked about trying to not reinvent the wheel, but coming together with different organizations that are doing similar work. 
We also talked about uh, COVID-19 creating a space for more of this collective action. Uh, we talked about resiliency, uh, not just bouncing back, but also about having power in the region. So how can we as a region have that power and agency over our future? Um, we talked about in terms of health, you know, what are the root causes of these health inequalities, specifically, you know, looking beyond COVID-19. Uh, we also talked about how this takes a lot of work. You know, a lot of this work is really difficult. Uh, Diana mentioned, you know, we need to be lifting up some of these like blue organizations, as she mentioned, um, and some specific funding needs that need to be there. We talked about the importance of community health workers, uh, specifically uh, promotores and, and their roles that are really important. And overall, uh, you know, looking at health with a holistic approach that, uh, you know, it, it's beyond just um, physical health, but talking about social determinants of health, including things like wealth, power, and prestige. Um, in terms of like our core values and some of the things that we lifted up specifically were uh, human-centered, solution-oriented, sustainability, um, obviously inclusion and, uh, you know, equity especially. So I think, you know, a lot of these values can fit into the buckets of equity inclusion, kind of as tools and vehicles to achieve some of these things. Great. Thank you, Gary. Next, we have Sarah Hayes, who will report back on the civic infrastructure breakout session. Sarah, by the way, is a graduate student at UC Riverside. Welcome, Sarah. Awesome, thank you, Eric. Uh, hi, everyone, thank you um, for being here today. Um, as Kirkwood mentioned, I am a graduate research associate at UCR in the uh, Center for Social Innovation, and I help co-facilitate the civic infrastructure uh, breakout session. And so from our session, I want to just um, echo my gratitude to Dr. Tori uh, and um, Armando uh, for their for their work and them just sharing their uh, the work that they've been doing in the IE. We saw with IE media them just being really intentional about having uh, local media here that is different and separate from the larger uh, media infrastructure um, in LA or San Diego. Um, and then we heard from Dr. Tori as well, the uh, intentional work that she's doing with youth in the IE. And just some like broad things that really came up in our session. Um, I think a lot of our discussion just generally wrapped around what is the story of the IE? Uh, what is that in 10 to 15 years from now, what is the IE going to be known for? And how do we incorporate civic infrastructure into telling that story? And um, a crucial point of that is the collaboration effort that we do when we're building up this infrastructure. So what we really heard um, just from different speakers in the room and, and different people was um, just the um, intentionality behind the collaborations that they do, um, really having these shared values of equity, of, of, of making sure that people who are most marginalized are the ones who are most propped up in these spaces. Um, and how do we make sure that when we talk about civic in infrastructure, everyone is included in that discussion. And so it was just, again, just a really good um, conversation on how do we collaboratively work together um, and making sure that we are asset based within that collaboration as well. And we are just really echoing just some of the really great talent that we have in this local region. Um, but I will uh, ping it over to uh, my co-facilitator, Paula, if you wanted to just uh, uh, add any more things that stuck out to you in the breakout session. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I came in a little late into that breakout session, um, so I was able to hear uh, or at least get to have the, uh, the group uh, start thinking about the shared values that we wanted to present to them. Um, there, was se there were several, so we took about a minute to really think through about uh, what would be the good two to three. But based off the results, it definitely touched upon what Sarah mentioned. So community, uh, community driven and collaboration came out really on top. Um, and I think that goes to show, right, how important that is to civic engage, uh, civic infrastructure and what, what, what the definition is of civic infrastructure. So uh, that's really about uh, 
how much we were able to, to get through. We didn't get to the norms and principles, but um, with the Google form, we'll definitely have asked the group to share uh, what they choose in uh, within that Google form. So if you haven't filled it out, please do so. And I think I will turn it to uh, education equity and that would be Evelyn Pruñera. Thank you, Paola. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome again. Thank you all for being here. My name is Evelyn Pruneda. I am a graduate student researcher and a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at UCR. Um, and I facilitated the education equity breakout session. And we had some absolute superstars in our group, as I'm sure all of the other breakout rooms did as well. Um, and we had a really diverse group of speakers, uh, you know, that worked at pretty much all levels of education. Um, and who work with multiple stakeholders, right, using really holistic approaches. Uh, so we spent some, some time talking about, you know, what are those key values that we want to, uh, we want to ensure really guides our collaborative work as we move forward. Um, and one of the, the first ones that, that um, kind of came across and a lot of folks talked about the need for equity and inclusion across the board, right. And so um, one of the, the comments really um, discussed about how important it is to ensure that disability is not omitted from that discussion, right? Um, another key value that really um, serves as a foundation for, um, for our work moving forward has to be trust, right? Collaboration is really challenging if you don't have um, that certain level of trust. And so uh, the need to be intentional about it is really important because it takes effort and it takes strategy to really be able to build that um, in our work. And then also one of the values that was um, that was missing uh, in that list really had to do with being student centered and using asset based approaches to um, be at the core of our collaborative work by right? using that shared leadership model. Um, one of our participants talked about how oftentimes, um, you know, the entire family is in disgust when thinking about student needs. So ensuring that um, we have that shared leadership model that doesn't omit the role of parents and the role of um, children and the role of educators as well. And then finally, transparency is key, right? One of our participants mentioned uh, the kind of ivory tower feeling that many folks experience when um, trying to engage with any of these educational institutions. Uh, sometimes it feels really foreign or, or new. So again, that's connected to that building trust piece, uh, but kind of having that transparency um, along with some of those other key values are really important. In terms of norms and operating principles, uh, one of them that uh, was omitted, and again, they, they kind of, you know, cross the board, but being student driven is really important um, in our collaborative work as, you know, in, in education here in the, in the IE. And then one of the questions came up about, we have all of these ideas, right? We have these incredible programs and initiatives, but how do we become more competitive um, you know, in terms of funding with some of those coastal regions, right, between LA or San Diego, what are the things that we need to, to do? Uh, so ensuring that, you know, we have, we actually name those common outcomes, aligning our vision um, to ensure that all of these outcomes between all of these different silos are woven together are really important. Um, so they're important not just for our individual issue areas, but also uh, that collaboration really helps us to compete with those other cities, right? Um, so it's important that we are all doing what we can to support each other um, and all of and all of our residents in, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, um, Evelyn. And so I'll be up uh, next uh, on uh, to talk about transportation and uh, environment. Um, first of all, I should just note, you know, as as the as the director of CSI, I'm just so incredibly proud of all of all of our folks uh, who facilitated, took notes, and are doing these report back sessions. Um, just truly grateful uh, for the deep bench strength that we have um, at our center. Uh, but really, to all of our community partners, right? There's no way that we can do any of this without you. And so we just, just huge gratitude for everyone for giving this the chance that we think it, it needs um, to be able to do some of this fundamental work together, even as we have so many things to do um, and are doing uh, in terms of advancing these core values in our region, to have this time uh, to be able to pause, 
to reflect, but really uh, we're, we're getting a lot done uh, in the work that we're doing here um, as we, uh, as we um, gather all this information together and aggregate it and really drive an agenda forward, which will come after this great breakout session. Uh, in terms of transportation and environment, we had an exciting session. It's exciting because there's so many great things that are happening that are already well underway. So we heard from Dwayne Baker at the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority that talked about a few different game-changing projects for the region uh, that really are taking us in a different direction as we move to the next decade. So one involves uh, what is often referred to as the Redlands Rail Project, uh, which is starting off uh, as a low diesel emission uh, train passenger uh, uh, rail that is going from Redlands. It, it uses the Metrolink track and ultimately will go all the way to LA Union Station. And fairly soon that will then convert to hydrogen fuel cells. So it'll be zero emission relatively soon. And I believe it'll be the first in the country uh, with that kind of a setup, uh, you know, that, that that's a true innovation when it comes to our transportation infrastructure. He also talked about um, the, um, I forget the name, is it Brightline? Um, I believe Brightline that was the name. West. Brightline West, that is, uh, that is slated to connect Las Vegas with Apple Valley. So it's very much a part of the Inland Empire already uh, in terms of uh, facilitating that, um, that transportation. Uh, but to also extend that all the way down to Rancho Cucamonga over the Cajon Pass. So that is something that looks very viable and an important part uh, of our future. That'll dramatically reduce uh, commute times between our high desert communities uh, and the valley. Uh, we also heard about um, the uh, Boring Tunnel Project uh, in, in Ontario Airport, as well as I believe it was an electric bus project. Dwayne, is that right? I'm sorry if I'm not remembering the exact name of that. It's called the uh, West Valley Connector, Bus Rapid Transit. Yeah. Excellent. So a lot happening when it comes to um, when it comes to transportation projects just in the county of San, San Bernardino. Um, and uh, we didn't get a chance to talk as much about uh, projects in um, Riverside County, but we have those. Uh, uh, as well that we will make sure to include um, in our packet. Um, we also uh, heard from Andrea Vidare from the People's Collective uh, for Environmental Justice. And Andrea talked about various um, efforts going on uh, connected with um, warehousing facilities, transportation projects, and these coalitions that have been built up uh, to make sure that uh, we're not just uh, giving lip service to community voice and community benefits, but to make sure uh, that the work that occurs actually lifts up community, lifts up workers. She talked about the High Road Training Partnership that um, that uh, that Chair Hariara talked about in the economic development session as well, as well as other efforts that are more um, uh, that are more future facing. Eric, if you could share the screen again, I think you lost the screen share. Um, we also heard from Matt Barth and Nicole Cleary at uh, UCR CERT. And Matt and Nicole talked about various projects that the center has been doing uh, over the years, if not decades, um, that, that involved the interface of innovation, uh, industry, um, and collaborations that really advance, um, advance uh, and improve our communities. Um, so part of that is under the OASIS framework. Uh, but it's also connecting up with other initiatives, including the clean logistics part of IEGO, um, work with the California Air Resources Board and its research facility that's coming online, uh, as well as other efforts. Um, we also talked a little bit about the Colton Intramodal facility, uh, which is very controversial in our region. If you don't know about it uh, and you are not in that breakout session, we strongly encourage everyone in the region to get informed about that. Essentially, in a nutshell, in the attempt to electrify the Los Angeles to Anaheim segment as part of the California High Speed Rail project, essentially freight traffic is going to be pushed in to the Inland Empire and to expansion of the Colton Intramodal facility. There's significant concern about what that will mean in terms of uh, diesel locomotive pollution concentrated in an area that's already severely impacted. Uh, but also what it will do to the associated truck traffic, not only in terms of environment, but increased commute times. If you think about all of those goods 
now that need to be moved from Colton to various parts of uh, LA County and um, Orange County. So uh, that's something that uh, we lifted up as, as maybe taking one or two steps back in terms of where other things are headed when it comes to clean transportation and environmental um, justice and, and improvements in uh, air quality uh, that we're starting to make. Um, what Matt Barth also signaled was that when you're talking about hybrid trucks and hybrid locomotives, those technologies are still about a couple of decades away in terms of full adoption. Uh, how do we make sure that we can accelerate some of that with, with some, of the, some, some of the things associated with culture and intermodal, but also are we prepared for the infrastructure when it comes to either fuel cells or it comes to electrification, or quite frankly, the kind of the road traffic that's gonna be generated by Colton Intramodal. So that's something uh, to keep in mind and for our region to think about how we can do different things, innovate, organize, collaborate, uh, to make sure that uh, we don't take our region several steps back in terms of our community health. Um, finally, we heard from Steve Lambert at 2020 Network, who talked about various opportunities connected with Ontario Airport um, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, and really trying to harness all that is possible um, when it comes to that as an asset. In terms of shared values, norms, and operating principles, some folks said that you know the things that we had, say in terms of empathy and solidarity, may be things that you want to put in as a, as a shared value. Um, what came up there as well as the other session was about excellence. Maybe not talk about excellence as something that's one among several, but to redefine excellence, right? When we talk about these shared values, then when we talk about excellence, it's not seen as a false choice between say excellence and equity. The, what it means to be excellent is to do all of these things. So I wanna give a hat tip to uh, Rodolfo Torres for flagging that and for others for you know double clicking and triple clicking on that. Uh, and that's something that I think we will probably do when we, re, when we put that framework out is to redefine what it means to be excellent. So it's not something that you pick and choose from different things, but really think about excellence as embodying all of those things. Um, so thank you. And I'm gonna turn it to Carla Lopez del Rio for the final report back. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, our team was a housing and community development uh, breakout session. And um, one thing that was very clear to us was that collaboration among housers is key. Uh, and the reason why is because we have such a demand for new housing and same as, you know, maintaining the old housing stock that we have. But uh, when it comes to new housing, uh, the demand is so large that even with all the builders here in the area, we can't uh, keep up with the demand. Um, so we have uh, different partners that play different roles. We heard from Nadia Vijagaram for Lift to Rise. Uh, Lift to Rise provides technical assistance and is, is doing a great effort in streamlining and helping uh, developers in the area not just have the information that they need, but also um, to have the funding that they need. So they're doing some serious uh, fundraising <clears throat> efforts and <clears throat> <clears throat> pooling funds, sorry, um, so that people can have access, developers ha can have access to developing homes. Uh, they have a very aggressive um, goal of 10,000 units in the next 10 years. Uh, so we're going to need to give them all the help that we that we can give them. Um, we, are, we also heard from uh, Kim Stars from United SoCal, United Way, and uh, they shared that they have almost 47 programs happening. We did not talk about all of them. We only talked about the rental assistance uh, that is going to be coordinated by uh, United Way. This is a, a big problem that we are facing all as a region. We may have a tsunami of evictions and foreclosures coming our way. That would be a big blow for a lot of the work that we've done here in the, in the region. So we need to be ready and coordinated. And this will, will um, affect not just the housers, but everybody on this call. This will be um, an issue that we will have to uh, bring, uh, bring solutions to and try to brainstorm and innovate uh, together. Um, after that, we heard from Nicole Starks. She shared um, a pretty stark uh, figure with us. 9% of people who are homeless are also veterans. That's heartbreaking. After what you've been through um, giving back to your country and to not have a home to call of your own is heartbreaking. So uh, US Vets is making a big um, effort to make sure that our um, homeless veterans are, uh, or veterans experiencing homelessness have a home uh, in the Inland Empire. So 
their work um, includes um, Riverside County, I believe they are uh, housing about 60 veterans and uh, they're looking to house about 100 to 79 more in San Bernardino area. After that, we heard from Damien O'Farrell, um, who is um, with Parkview Legacy Foundation. This was a hospital that was, I believe, turned into uh, health and housing. Um, they are doing production of, uh, of housing as well. And they're really focusing on the, on the homeless and the housing initiatives in the Southern California region. Um, they have <clears throat> um, centers that evaluate uh, the power projects that are coming in, empowering organizations and communities so that they can do this work. And then we heard from Karen Suarez from Uplift San Bernardino uh, that are trying to build not just rental assistance in, uh, in rental units in San Bernardino, but they're also focusing on homeownership and homeownership being one of the big drivers here to the Inland Empire that we need, uh, that we need to uplift as well. Um, they're working also with partners in advocacy um, and, and in getting the community voices into the system and into the into uh, guiding some of this this building that we'll have. Uh, we talked about about the importance of understanding where our populations live and who lives where and uh, how to adequately build for those populations. Uh, but above all, what uh, what they really uh, came out with is this sense of we need to lift each other up and leverage each other's efforts. Um, collaboration uh, in, a, in the true sense. Uh, another thing that they mentioned is that there is not just collaboration among housers, it's collaboration with cities in specific. Uh, cities have the ability to streamline it and make housing available and possible uh, in ways that they may not know. So one of the things that the uh, group wanted to uh, work on uh, or talk about was the need to provide technical assistance to some of the cities. And there was an um, there was a, an example with the city of Blythe um, that is now successfully building homes and it was because they had the support from developers and communities giving them the technical assistance that they that they have. So we need to recognize that most of the cities that we have in the Inland Empire are not uh, wealthy cities. Mo most of the cities that we have here are either moderate or low income um, um, cities, but that means that they have all that opportunity as well, that we need to understand that that's the people that we're building for and that those are the people that make us passionate to come to work every day. So that was a report back graphic from that breakout. Thank you so much, Carla. And uh, thank you everyone. I mean, y'all are the hardcore because you made it through two breakout sessions and you're, and you're here in the work. So just truly grateful. And of course, there's some that had to drop off, but just really grateful uh, for, um, for your co, you know, your, your participation and really to, uh, to co-design what's going to be a pretty powerful set of uh, recommendations that are going to come out uh, from this summit. Um, we asked you to lift up um, the uh, core values that you that, you, that, that, that you would prioritize. So I'm going to ask either Paula or Eric, whoever has it from our form. So um, we're learning as we do this, and I'm liking the fact that we're not just using the Zoom polling feature because this is something that's going to uh, that's going to be helpful as we um, finish out the report. Pretty clear trends here. Um, equity is something that that uh, you know that's high um, across the board. But th there, there's some other things here that are also worth lifting up. Community driven. That is also coming out pretty loud and clear um, from the feedback that we're getting. Collaboration. Uh, of course, you know, someone will say this is a bias sample. Yes, this is a bias sample. These are people who collaborate. These are people who care about equity. These are people who uh, want things to be community driven. But we're hoping that it's, we're not just preaching to the choir here, that these would be values that folks that are not in the room um, uh, will, will also agree. Uh, let's look at another cluster there, right? Solution oriented, shared leadership, sustainability, trust justice, um, inclusion, and belonging. These are all powerful. Um, so thank you so much for, um, for lifting these up. And then Paula, if you could scroll down to what we had on the, um, on the operating principles, the next graph that we have, right? So there we go. So we have uh, additionally, I mean, there's, there's you know, high, it's, it's high on a bunch of these, uh, but when you think about accountability, respect, integrity, empathy, solidarity, all of those came up. Now, this notion of avoiding a crabs in a bucket mentality, 
Um, uh, so hopefully in different sessions, you were, you were able to hear what that was about. Uh, for those who didn't have the uh, you know, full blown explanation, essentially this idea that as we're trying to lift uh, different communities up through different initiatives, let's not pull each other down. Let's try to find ways to collaborate or align, or at the very least, um, you know, not think that our progress comes at the expense of others. And this is something that I'll say even personally, that this is something that I think we all can, can model and do better, but we are fortunately moving in the right direction as a region when we do this. Um, so thank you, Paula, for um, sharing that. Um, and thank you everyone for, um, for um, helping us flesh out these values and operating principles. Now, as we move ahead and thinking of next steps, we had already heard uh, from Kurt Lewis, from Congressman Pete Aguilar's office, in terms of that uh, community um, CPF. What does that stand for, Paula? Sorry, oh, uh, community community uh, project funding uh, opportunities. Um, you know, th that's one example of what we can do, or actually, what we must do. If we're talking about each member of Congress having 10 projects that they can support, uh, we need to have some kind of uh, coordinated way to be able to do this across uh, different congressional districts. We also, uh, Kurt talked about the American Rescue Plan and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming down uh, to the counties and to the state and being better uh, organized around that. So with that, I want to um, invite Josh Candelaria who uh, you, you saw him before when he used to work for San Bernardino County, but Josh, if you could talk about your new role, and we know that you've been a longstanding champion of inclusion and community. I mean, I'll, I'll just say, Josh, the way we, our center got involved with census and really pulling both counties together um, and all the various governments, as well as the partnerships with philanthropy and our, our community-based organizations. I want to credit you, Josh, specifically and personally, for bringing a lot of the government actors and to kind of demystify what it means to do community partnership. Um, and if you can just talk a little bit about your new role, but if we can have a little bit of a strategy session, I mean, you, you bring so much expertise in terms of public affairs and public relations and the work that you've done for in different uh, venues, what advice can you give us as we think about doing this in a kind of coordinated and strategic way uh, in terms of advancing an agenda of inclusion and sustainability, resilience and equity. So thank you, Karthik. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, first of all, I just really want to thank um, each and every single one of you. You lead with values, and I appreciate that. I have worked with many of you. I was going through the RSVP lesson. Most of your values, not just your organization, but personally are crystallized. And I think when you lead with your values, uh, you uh, do good work and you uh, do it effectively. And so thank you for advocating for individuals that can't advocate for themselves, but more importantly, putting them in a position and equipping them to advocate at the end of the day for themselves in built capacity. So I transitioned out of the county for background purposes, was the county's uh, legislative director, Sam Rodino, for gosh, worked for the county for 15 years, transitioned out and doing consulting. So I just really appreciate, and have seen the region grow, and we're really at a pivotal point. If you look at the capacity of our delegation, state and federal, We've got the majority leader. We've got uh, three members uh, on appropriations on the federal side. We've got number of uh, committee chairmen um, and ch chairwomen as well, members on the budget committee. So we are really ripe, I think, to do some really strategic things. So I wanted to talk about just three items. One, the importance of really um, regionalization within the context of public policy. Two, talk about a example of how that partnership regionally really helped address some impediments on the sea level for us to secure funding. And lastly, talk about some funding opportunities where regional partnerships hopefully can leverage those things. So for background purposes, uh, from a regional perspective, it's always good to go into an office and be able to articulate that we are representing not just one agency, but the region. Quite frankly, we, um, we know that we're competing against other parts of the state. The last thing we want to do is compete against each other. So that was a guiding principle for me at the county. Whenever we offered something or we advocated for something, it was well thought out. It was uh, you know, vetted by our partners and it really was reflective, I think, of the individuals that we serve. And so regionalizing and really from a public policy 
standpoint, makes it easier for that member, that member of Congress to be able to expend the capital and knowing that they're going to benefit not just the agency, but a broad, wide region. Two, just an example of how that regionalization worked. Um, quite a couple of years ago, we weren't getting greenhouse reduction funds. The governor, under Governor Brown, uh, we were uh, basically two different funding cycles missing on millions of dollars. And the challenge was is that when we started to drill down, there was three factors I heard from the state, from the governor's office, in addition to the strategic Growth council. One, they said, you guys aren't willing to make the cultural changes. Why should we invest into the region with greenhouse gas reduction funds? If you're relying upon certain industries, fossil fuel, you guys need to make those changes. Two, um, you guys just don't really work together well sometimes. And three, you guys just don't have the capacity really to handle grants. And so we begin to work with uh, the county with a number of agencies that we historically haven't. CCAJ under uh, Penny Newman stewardship, um, Shaharian from Law House Workers, um, uh, other individuals that the county just did not approach, recognizing that we had shared values and more importantly, that we wanted to overcome some of these challenges and perceptions in Sacramento. So about 15 different organizations came together. There were seven different projects for TCC um, that could have been successful. We decided to consolidate those seven projects to just pick one. It was actually the city of Ontario. The county defaulted on a project and said, we really want to get over this perception. We want to say we work well together. We want to say we're making cultural changes by working with partners that we haven't. And more importantly, we have the capacity and we can manage it. So that kind of regionalization, really focusing on our values, really allowed, I think, a project to move forward. Subsequent to that, we've got multiple investments from DGR funds within the region. And I think it was instrumental because we worked together and really identified those shared values. And lastly, there's some pending, some pending funding opportunities um, regionally that that partnership, which you guys are starting and continuing, really can leverage resources in the area. And there's three, I'll touch on them. From the local level, both counties have received a substantial investment from the federal government. Those aren't necessarily discretionary funds, there's guardrails, but both counties are gonna to have to make a determination of where those funds go. Regional partnership will allow to make the case to either board of supervisors articulating this as a good investment. Two, on the state level, I would watch really the May revise and see where the state's projections are coming out. Members are able to advocate for priorities within their districts. Regionalization will help that member recognize that you're not just representing your organization, but you're representing those people you serve as well as partners. And lastly, I think Kurt Lewis alluded to it, your marks are back on a smaller scale. Those are opportunities for congressional members to identify projects within their district that are worthy to receive funding. One of the requirements is community support. So by emphasizing that partnership and being able to go to that member helps them make the case that that investment is not only prudent, but it'll actually make some cultural changes. And so with that, I think I really do appreciate your time and just the partnership I have with Josh, thank you so much. I, I feel like we just got a crash course in terms of how to do uh, effective community advocacy and uh, investments. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I am going to go there uh, and, and, uh, I, and Tony Simons, you can you can like beg off if you don't want to speak, but Tony Simons from uh, staff in the legislature and the Jetty Committee. Tony, I would love to hear your thoughts, right, in terms of how you hear and perceive the region and maybe just building on what Josh said. And, and Eric, if you can take the spotlight off Josh for a second, uh, just to hear, you know, and, uh, you know, as filtered or unfiltered as you'd like to be, Tony, would love to hear your thoughts about what you, what advice you would give for our region to be better organized and prepared uh, in terms of these different kinds of investment opportunities, either from government uh, or elsewhere. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I think that one of the things that's particularly unique, aside that it's the best region, um, <laughs> but um, I think that one of the things that's particularly unique about this region, um, as I work with other regions, is that you have, and, and I think Karthik laid out and we've all been talking about it, you have a wide variety of projects not just economic development projects, but projects directly related to being um, inclusive, trying to do some really deep work. Um, one might argue that that's, that's how you're able to do deep, deep work because you're not saying we only have one thing. Um, but what that does is it creates a unique challenge in Sacramento. And that is that, of course, members are saying, oh, I would love for my communities to come together and tell me, you know, what's the thing that I should do? And then I'll partner with the other members in my region. I don't think that that can necessarily happen 
but it's kind of what we've been working on today. What's the network of projects? What do we collectively feel has value? And I love the the crabs in the bucket, um, you know, and not be, oh, well, that's not a good project because it didn't happen in my town. But so having a really an understanding that as uh, we do better work for uh, minority uh, female business owners, that that's helping large groups of people, um, helping people in the city of Riverside um, is has value in a larger sense. But so part of the work is in the region collectively kind of getting um, our head around what do we want to do and then figuring out how to translate that to Sacramento. Um, I will say that, you know, there's a bill, a, a, AB 106, um, the Regions Rise, it's a grant program. It would be at uh, Mr. Solace is the, uh, Assembly Member Solace is the author. The bill uh, would give money from GoBiz to Regions to do collaborative work. What we're hearing from most of the regions, they're like, great, I'd like to have my $150,000, $250,000. Um, one of the things our committee did when we heard the bill last year, and it's still in the bill, is to say that more than one grant could be given to a region if the project they're working on is, is you know, distinctly different. But I, I have to say that our region here in the Inland Empire is the only one I've heard that. So I think there's multiple I think it's very valuable that there are multiple initiatives going on. So then the thing is, okay, how do we make that a rational narrative? So our, we as a community, our elected officials here um, can actually be successful advocates in Sacramento. Great, thank you, Tony. Well, one of the things, and then I think you were, you were able to join for parts of what we had today, but we are gonna to put together that initiative map so that it's not just the people who, Many people may not even know about that Regents Rise grant opportunity, right? But we wanna make sure that we don't perpetuate some of the biases. And if we are talking about inclusive and equitable work that, that you have everyone aware of what's going on. And I, I, you know, hopefully, I, I, I am hopeful, I am optimistic that the way we show up is that it can be a both and doing that deep inclusion work and finding ways to coordinate. And also sometimes it's about bargaining. Sometimes it means that you take this one and we take it next year, or you take this opportunity and we take that other opportunity. Uh, I, I'm hopeful, at least from what I can see, is that our collective leadership is maturing in a way that we don't, part of that is that avoiding the crabs in the mentality bucket, but also that starvation mindset, so that everyone is grabbing that first thing that's coming there and just like tugging, uh, tugging away at it uh, and not seeing that there's so many other things um, that are behind uh, what is you know immediately in front of us? So, thank you so much, Tony, for uh, for that perspective. Before we go into next steps, I would like to invite anyone else who either wants to share. And actually, what I would say is, if if there are folks who are inspired to say, you know, please join me in 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 kind of the work that's ahead, or anything else that they want to reflect on, at least from their years of experience. I would say, especially for folks outside the region, you know, we hear a lot in terms of within, you know, from ourselves, but we don't want to just, uh, you know, uh, sing our own praises. Any, any, anyone from outside the region, if they want to offer any thoughts before we uh, go to next steps. So as Eric said, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, so we see Councilwoman Blanca Gomez, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And if you could introduce yeah. where, you, uh, which jurisdiction you're from. Uh, so my name is Blanca Gomez and I'm a current council member for the city of Victorville, which is held uh, within the, the confines of the county of San Bernardino, which is the IE. So I thank you for asking for um, individuals who would like to see if any ideas are relevant and they are. And I think uh, as many has, have echoed, we do have the same heart as to look for equity and community engagement and the such. Um, and I see a huge arsenal with all of you here um, that are very experienced. And it's unfortunate that I find myself in the city of Victorville almost having to fight for equity for what we do have a vast majority of individuals who are not only poverty stricken, but very disenfranchised and marginalized in many of many aspects from education, transportation, and the such. And my call is for any of you to um, 
be able to collaborate and bring me into that floor so that we're empowered to really help our communities. Because it's when it's just one person or it feels like it's one person and you don't have organizations and meetings are happening within 24 hour notices, it makes it very difficult to advocate for the disenfranchised. So I'm just, I'll put my contact in the chat and um, hopefully we can, you know, some type of collaboration. There's a lot of writing that needs to happen, a lot of advocacy. And I know each one of you have a passion and a heart and um, being able to have your expertise at a council level would really um, bring more equitable and it would be more community driven rather than sometimes the best interest of self or um, a status quo mentality that we are benefiting a lot of the time on the backs of a lot of our communities that are disenfranchised. And that kind of pains my heart, but to see these organizations that really look for something different and want to make changes in the communities and you're very well aware of what's happening in the surroundings, I think that's the empowerment that um, I'm asking to, to bring forth in the community. So I'll put yeah. my information and thank you for letting me share. Thank you, council member. Mm -hmm. um, I just put in the chat, and again, I don't wanna call on anyone, uh, you know, voluntold anyone, but if there's anyone else from philanthropy or government or industry um, that, uh, you know, have any uh, final thoughts of, of uh, either inspiration or, or just reflection uh, before we talk about next steps, uh, we invite you to, to say something. So I'll just uh, be quiet for a minute to see if anyone has anything to add. Okay, well, hopefully in the, while I talk about next steps, someone will feel moved to, uh, before we close to, uh, you know, offer some, some additional thoughts. Community members, uh, you know, nonprofits and other community organizations also welcome uh, to chime in. Please also feel free to continue chiming in in the chat. Please don't be shy uh, as well. So if you have something that you wanna make sure to say before we leave, please do say it. Um, Arthur, I see you. Go ahead, Arthur. Thank you, yeah. I wanted to leave room for those original groups you called out, but uh, so I'm, I'm with the Redford Conservancy for Southern California Sustainability at Pitzer College. And one of the ideas that we're also really interested in is, you know, there's big talk right now about an infrastructure program, a jobs program coming out of the Biden administration, and really considering that uh, in the IE, which is a soil rich region, the, the ground, the soil itself is still one of the biggest pieces of infrastructure that we have and that we can invest in. And really considering that there's still thousands of farm workers, you know, farther out in the Coachella Valley, and even outside of what we know as the IE, but moving towards the border, borderlands, um, and really just not losing track or losing the opportunity to invest in our soil. Um, there's a big interest in getting down to net zero emissions as far as transportation and electrifying and all this kind of stuff, but we also have to draw down excess CO2 that already exists in the atmosphere to address climate change. There's emerging ideas of carbon markets and opportunities potentially for investment in, in things like planting trees, regenerative agriculture, uh, you know, rangeland, using composting and restoration of, of kind of marginal lands um, and turning them into carbon sinks. So I think that's something I just wanna put out there that the soil is still a, a valuable resource in the IE and we're headed towards all kinds of development from housing to logistics, to retail, to transit. And the more we can preserve soil uh, and as a resource that can be, uh, es that is essential in, in addressing climate change and also potentially putting thousands of people to work in terms of, uh, you know, COVID safe, outdoor, um, green jobs uh, right. that, are, that are not high tech, but that are almost low tech, if you will, um, addressing the soil as a resource. Great, thank you, Arthur. Um, I'm just gonna uh, just hold and ask, um, well, I don't know if uh, South Margarita Luna in among the participants, a couple of other funders too, but I'm wondering about the Inland Empire Funders Alliance. If there's anyone who's, if either Margarita or others who are from the Inland Empire Funders Alliance can say a little bit about the work that the Funders Alliance has been able to achieve over the last few years and their vision moving forward uh, welcome that as well as we uh, move into next steps. So uh, Margarita, I don't know if um, I know that Margarita is also multitasking with, with um, 
helping our kids in terms of their education. So I don't know if either Margaret or anyone else from the Funders Alliance is on the line and can can offer some remarks. Um, okay, looks like Margaret is not here. So I'll ask, and maybe Armando from the IE Media Table. I know that you we heard about that in the civic infrastructure, but Armando, if you can talk a little bit about what you see is exciting in the media space in this region before we go to next steps. Hey, Karthik, let me turn on my... Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and thank you everyone uh, who participated in, in our uh, conversation. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I highlighted and that we've been trying to highlight with the IE Media Table is, is just the, the information ecosystem that we're working to, to create um, uh, across the region uh, and, and ensuring that, um, you know, the, that our stories are told and that our voices are heard. Um, I think we, we want to create a space um, where not only we can access uh, the, uh, the the media of the region, but but also build and strengthen the media infrastructure across both Riverside and San Bernardino. So um, excited to support in this effort. Excited to always be part of these conversations. Um, and if if we can be uh, supportive or helpful uh, in any any way to amplify the amazing work that's happening across the board, uh, please reach out um, both on the on the media uh, roundtable. Um, aspect, but also just in general, uh, capacity building and, and communication strategy. So thank you, Karthik. Excellent. Thank you, Armando. And Margarita, we had some tech issues, but I'm hoping that you're able to, uh, Eric, I don't know if she can unmute. Great. Thank you, Margarita. If you can say us a little, tell us a little bit about the Inland Empire Funders Alliance, Margarita, and what the kind of strategic direction is moving forward. Yeah, thanks so much, Karthik. And sorry, everyone, I'm not on camera. I am multitasking. Um, you know, the Funders Alliance has really come a long way in the past 10 years that I've been involved in it. And, you know, this year now taking leadership as chair um, from tremendous leadership from Celia at the Inland Empire um, Community Foundation. You know, we, we are now uh, implementing a strategic plan that is really centering equity advocacy and systemic change in the work that we do. And really what we plan to do and what we are doing is really organizing philanthropy in the region. Uh, which has been really important because as much as we are, you know, supporting our grantee partners and government partners to really enter into collaboration, we also have to be part of this work and collaborate with one another as well as with our partners on the ground. And so it's really exciting to see us more intentionally organize philanthropy so that we can have a greater impact in the region. No, no one of us can really, um, you know, change the the change the environment of the Inland Empire alone. It really takes a collective effort. And so as much as we're pushing our grantee partners to really have a collective effort, that's really the intention of, of where we're moving uh, forward. And so we have a number of pool funds that we've launched in the past few years, both on census, on COVID, on the partnering with the Black Equity Initiative on a trust-based philanthropy and um, participatory grant making aspect of their work to launch the, the Black Equity Fund as well. And then uh, next we're, we're actually uh, launching a redistricting fund as well that is really about uh, democratizing the redistricting process and ensuring that as many community partners really understand the importance of redistricting and how to get involved and engaged and elevating their voice and the voices of the, the folks that they serve and, and organize in the region. So lots of really exciting efforts to come. Um, including, you know, just ensuring that we're pushing philanthropy, all of our partners to really move in a trust-based model, which is really, a, it's really an equity approach. So excited about moving forward and partnering with you all here. Great. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, if you could put up that last slide then, Eric, in terms of our next steps, and these are our commitments to you. Um, and please do continue to reach out to us uh, and keep people to contact. As you can see there, Paula is uh, is is your source for uh, you know any follow up on this? But by April eighth, we're going to have that updated initiative map on our website. Uh, so please do fill out that Google form that was in your uh, Eventbrite, uh, or you can just go to our Eventbrite page. I'm going to ask uh, someone to drop it in the chat as well um, to to make sure that we're lifting up these different initiatives. Um, in the month of April, uh, please be aware that by April fourteenth is the deadline for the community project uh, funding requests. Um, so uh, oh, actually, I guess members have their own internal deadlines. At least some that I've seen are, 
are coming up soon within two weeks. So um, please, uh, if, if I suppose we could help uh, in terms of uh, coordination. So if there are folks that would like to see a more uh, coordinated effort and if our center can play a helpful role, please let us know. We certainly don't want to uh, meddle in, in places where we don't need to get involved at all. We have a lot uh, of other things to do, but if we can be helpful, let us know. But hopefully um, through this effort and through that initiative map that we'll put up, people will see the contact information for others. So that, as Josh had said earlier, um, you know, that we're not, uh, we're not all, you know, we're not competing against each other, that we can be more coordinated uh, in terms of uh, the different thematic areas uh, and knowing how to approach different member offices with this uh, funding opportunity. By the way, I believe um, for that funding opportunity, they have to be ready to go and already operational and they, the monies need to be fully spent by September, 2022. By April 30th, we will have a report out of the summit and key recommendations. So again, if there's anything that we're missing, um, please do fill out that initiative map uh, and we will follow up uh, if we need to get our um, clarification. Um, there's ongoing outreach and partnership uh, that's, uh, that's to come. Uh, we also have other events, uh, including an interfaith uh, tri-county partnership that's coming up next week. Please go to socialinnovation.ucr.edu slash events, and you will see different events that we have, and we welcome your participation. And Carla just dropped that in the chat as well. Uh, so um, with that, um, I'm going to uh, ask Eric to stop the screen share so we get to see each other uh, before we leave. But thank you all so much. Uh, just really uh, continue to be inspired by, by all of you and the work that we do together. Uh, more to come. Um, thank you for spending and, and for the hardcore reviews, but three hours with us this morning. Thank you so much. Just enormous gratitude um, and look forward to working with you in the work ahead.